Hello everyone and a warm welcome from the home of FIFA here in Zurich, Switzerland. We are just a few months away from the FIFA World Cup 2022 and today we will be talking to FIFA's iconic former referee Pierluigi Colina about one of the most important changes to offside detection we will see in Qatar. And we will show you a groundbreaking FIFA project in South Sudan, one of the newest members of the FIFA family. We are ready, so welcome to Living Football. The FIFA World Cup is rapidly looming on the horizon. We are looking forward to the biggest sporting event in the world. And as we all know, harnessing technology is one of the explicit goals in the President's Vision 2023. Today, we want to talk about the next milestone in the history of the VAR with Pierluigi Colina, Chairman of FIFA's Referee Committee and FIFA Director of Football Technology and Innovation, Johannes Holzmüller. Johannes, thanks for being with us. It's nice to have you here again on the sofa. Thank you. But we want to start with Pierluigi, the best referee of all time. Pierluigi, buongiorno. FIFA has just announced that semi-automated offside technology will be used at the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. What are we looking forward to? The VAR has been a great success so far. Although the implementation of uh, VAR has been very successful uh, so far, we are not to forget that uh, it's something uh, uh, relatively new. Uh, the first match played uh, with this new technology was uh, only in 2016. Uh, two years later at the FIFA World Cup uh, uh, in Russia uh, with uh, a great success. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, VAR is uh, uh, used almost in all uh, the major competition around the globe. Um, but we are aware that uh, there are some aspects that need to be improved and among them uh, certainly uh, offside. Uh, we know that uh, sometimes it takes too long uh, to make uh, uh, a final decision on uh, uh, offside incidents, particularly when the incidents are very uh, difficult to be assessed. Today, uh, players, attackers and defenders are very good uh, in playing around the uh, offside line and uh, uh, very often the, the, the offside incidents uh, are really, really very tight. Um, therefore, uh, we decided to develop, uh, together with uh, various partners, uh, some uh, uh, new technologies to try uh, to um, limit the time needed and also uh, to be more uh, accurate. Uh, for this reason, at the, at the FIFA World Cup 2022 in Qatar, uh, there will be two new technologies uh, implemented. One is the so-called uh, semi-automated uh, offside technology, and the other one is the uh, connected ball. We will speak about the connected ball later with Johannes. Last time you've been on the show, Pierluigi, we already spoke about semi-automated offside technology. Can you briefly explain again for those who didn't see the episode how it works and why it is called semi-automated offside? It's uh, semi-automated offside because uh, the final decision is still uh, taken by the uh, video match official. Without going uh, too much into details, uh, there will be uh, 12 cameras uh, tracking uh, the um, position of the players on the field of play. Uh, each player has uh, up to 29 uh, data points uh, and uh, uh, data will be sent uh, up to 50 times per second. So the position of the player will be determined very accurately on the field of play, in particular limbs, as well as all the other parts of the body relevant to the offside. Uh, to the offside. Uh, similarly to the position of the player, also the, uh, the ball is, uh, is, is tracked by uh, these 12 cameras, and uh, it is a very new ball, it's a connected ball with a sensor inside, sending uh, uh, data up to 500 times per uh, seconds. This is very important to determine with uh, uh, the highest accuracy the uh, kicking point, which is also relevant to determine the position of uh, uh, the player at that 
particular moment. Uh, of course, uh, these, two, these two new technologies will help very much uh, the, the, the check of uh, uh, the position because whenever a player who was in an offside position receives uh, uh, the ball, uh, an alert uh, will be sent uh, the VAR and the VAR will be able immediately to check uh, this position with the technology itself uh, drawing uh, the, uh, the offside line. This will reduce the time needed for the assessment as well as the, uh, the accuracy will be uh, improved. Um, the aim is to, uh, to give an answer uh, as quick as possible with this answer very, very, very accurate. As the VAR has to validate the decision, uh, the final decision, before informing the referee, uh, this is the reason why it is called uh, uh, semi-automated offside, because there is still the intervention of the human being uh, to make the final call. How does this new technology work towards referees on the field? Our objective is uh, to, uh, to prepare the referee as best as possible, uh, to avoid uh, to use the technology. But the technology is there to, to avoid that uh, uh, a mistake uh, is committed. Uh, even the best referee can commit a mistake, he's a human being, we know it, uh, and uh, that's why we, we implemented uh, a, a system using tools that uh, can really reduce uh, the, the possibility that uh, a human mistake can affect the outcome of a match. For fans watching matches in the stadium or at home, how will they receive this information? This is something that uh, we also uh, considered. So once the decision-making process uh, has been uh, uh, completed and uh, the decision taken by the VAR, uh, the same uh, data points uh, which were used to determine the player's position uh, will be generated into a 3D um, animation. And uh, uh, this animation will be uh, shown uh, on uh, the giant screen at the uh, FIFA World Cup uh, 2022 stadiums, as well as, uh, uh, will, be pro as, well as will be provided the uh, TV broadcasters and uh, uh, the TV viewers will be able to see uh, them on their uh, televisions. Pierluigi, you were one of the best, well, let's say the best referee in the world. Do you wish there had been something like this back in like 1998? Uh, nobody likes to make uh, uh, a mistake, uh, even myself, when I was on the field of play, I never liked to be, to be wrong, uh, so certainly I would have been delighted to be somehow saved by the intervention of technology uh, when uh, I committed a mistake. Which almost never happened, Pierluigi. Thank you very much, mille grazie. Have a great day. And we want to pick up right here on the sofa with Johannes Holzmüller, FIFA Director of Football Technology and Innovation. Johannes, it's the second time for you in the studio. Seems you are a friend of the show now. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure uh, being here uh, in the studio and talking with you about the latest technologies in football. And it's always so interesting. You are FIFA's Director of Football Technology and Innovation, as we mentioned, and have been leading the way when it comes to harnessing technology in football. And the VAR, for example, was a great success at the FIFA World Cup 2018. So what was FIFA's thought process in the wake of that tournament in terms of improving the system? Yeah, exactly. As you said, it was a great success. And uh, of course, we try to constantly improve the different systems and solutions that we bring to the world of football. And by monitoring not only the FIFA tournaments, but also the leagues around the world uh, who are applying uh, VAR, we realize that there are certain areas where we can further improve uh, this, the setup and the workflow. So uh, the most obvious one for us was uh, the offside decision-making process because we checked with our providers and we found out that in average on a global level it takes 70 seconds until the decision for an offside incident is made. 
So that means 70 seconds that the players have to wait on the pitch, the referee have to wait on the pitch, but also the fans we, the have, audience. To, have to wait. So therefore we said, okay, this is something we want to improve. And so we, our main objective, our main goal was to make this process faster as well as more accurate or as accurate as possible. So there have been several trial runs also at the FIFA Club World Cup now. How has the technology grown over time and how reliable is it? Yeah, so we started, as you correctly said, after the last World Cup. Um, and in 2019, we had a very first meeting with technology providers and universities around the world. We told them about what we plan to do. So we want to reduce this time This is needed to make this, uh, this decision as well as to make it as accurate as possible. At that time, only a few companies said, okay, we would like to go with you and we would like to uh, look into what we can do. So we started this process in 2019 with first demonstrations, with first uh, ideas uh, and discussions poss about possible solutions. But then unfortunately in 2020, due to COVID, we had to postpone all our tests. So uh, actually we started with really physical tests in 2021. So we went to different stadiums around the world. We implemented different technologies from different providers and we looked into all the different possible solutions and the best solutions that we always brought to FIFA tournaments like the FIFA Club World Cup or the FIFA Arab Cup uh, to find out, okay, what is the best solution to reach our goal. So finally, we decided uh, to have uh, semi-automated offside technology, which is based on, on, on tracking technology as well as a connected ball because we believe that it's very reliable. So all the test results that we have seen are very reliable, as well as uh, the data is very accurate. So we use different universities around the world to help us to, to analyze, to validate this data, but also to improve this data together with the technology providers. Besides COVID, what was the biggest challenge? Yes, I think the biggest challenge was um, or has been so far that we are using different technologies on one side limb tracking, so optical tracking with cameras installed in the stadium. On the other side, the connected ball where data is coming out of the ball at the end. To connect this data, to synchronize this data, I think that was definitely one of the main challenges and where we worked a lot on uh, to bring the, all the different data sources together that it can be used in a very simple way by the VAR at the end. So finally, how quickly can offsite decisions be made now? Best case scenario. Yes, uh, I think you, uh, Paluigi, also uh, mentioned something in this regard. As I mentioned, or as I said before, we are talking about 70 seconds at the moment as an average. So all our tests have, or in our tests, we have seen that we can do it in a much shorter time period. So we can significantly reduce this uh, required time, which means at the end that fans in the stadium, the referees on the pitch, as well as the players, they do not have to wait uh, so long any, any longer. So what is the next step towards uh, the FIFA World Cup now? Will there be final tests? Uh, yes, of course. So we, uh, in the coming weeks, we will continue our testing. Uh, we want to define, fine tune uh, the system for the World Cup. But of course, also as a next step, we are planning to create a global standard to enable all the leagues around the world uh, to use this technology. Um, and then finally, of course, as we have already done, but we will continue to do that, we will inform all the teams, participating teams of the World Cup, as well as the media and the public about what semi-automated offside is and how it, how it can improve the football ex experience. Yeah, it starts here. Thank you very much, Thank Johannes so Holzmüller. Well, we are looking forward to significantly faster and more accurate offside decisions. It was great to have you here. You're always welcome. Thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you, Jessica. And speaking of being welcome, one of FIFA's youngest member associations is South Sudan, an East African state founded in 2011. Earlier this year, FIFA president Gianni Infantino noted the significant commitment to develop women's football in South Sudan in collaboration with the FIFA Women's Football Division. A lot has happened since then and women's football is alive and kicking. <music> We 
at FIFA have launched our women's football strategy in 2018 and one of our key objectives was to grow participation of girls and women across the world. In order to be able to grow participation in some of our member associations, we have to address their context and understand how best to support them. When speaking to South Sudan, we understood that apart from um, having access to sports and football, the girls were facing different challenges. In their particular case, it was also um, related to menstrual hygiene and access to um, sanitary products. Um, so the idea came um, together with the South Sudan Football Association that we start a pilot project that uses football activities, but then around those football activities provides capacity building for the girls and women um, around menstrual hygiene, as well as then providing them with the sanitary pads that are reusable for up to one year. This way we start addressing those girls that are already in football, making sure that they come back to football, um, that they can perform, but at the same time go to school, because we've seen that this is not an issue just in terms of accessing sport, but also um, accessing education and going regularly to school. The menstrual hygiene product is a, uh, is a pilot project that uh, FIFA has, has um, kindly taken to South Sudan. I think it's the first of its kind. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's huge for us because especially in a country like South Sudan where we've come, uh, if you look at the poverty line, I mean, 80, 82% of the people in this country is below that line. And they live off like 2% um, or $2 per day. So um, this project really opens our eyes, gives us a platform um, to create more ambassadors for the program, but also, you know, just to create awareness around the problem that female athletes and just females in general in this country face. We understand that we in Africa, we have a lot of barriers for women to participate in these sports, and especially in football. But currently with the, this huge campaign with our, from South Sudan Football Association, and women section within the South Sudan Football Association, as well also the, the FIFA encouragement. We have this energy and, uh, and there is now we have, uh, there, there is a, a quick response to this campaign. And this year we have introduced for the first time the league, the women league in different states. So there are so many clubs and uh, competition is going on. So we thanks the FIFA and we thanks, uh, in particular, we thanks the women football in FIFA for encouraging us. And also we, we also thanks the, the CAF Women Football Development for encouraging uh, women of South Sudan to come to this level. In order to address their grassroots activities, their youth competitions, their senior competitions, we have to understand where are these girls coming from? and what is particular for their environment. What we've learned coming to South Sudan in a couple of our visits is that um, even within the country, different, in different regions, different girls are facing um, different challenges. And it's really bringing them uh, together to understand what are those challenges and if they are related to the menstrual hygiene topic and the sanitary products, um, we can address it through this project and going forward, understanding some of the other challenges to really make sure that there is a long-term um, football development in the country that allows girls a, a very clear pathway um, to play, but also to, to remain within the game once they are done with their playing careers. South Sudan for years have, you know, have had different perceptions when it comes to menstruation or the menstruation cycle of a woman. They feel it is something that should be a secret to the point that some cultures are not so open to their children and this may drive to a lot of uh, bad stuff or maybe challenges that a girl would face knowing that her parents or the people around her have been a little bit ignorant. So having this project in South Sudan, first of all, is so important to the point that at least it changes our mindset on how menstruation should be handled. And it also gives us an awareness that menstruation is part of life, but then how then do you handle it when it comes to you? And how do you keep on with your activities? And this has been some challenges, most especially when it comes to the women in football. So I feel this project is already changing a lot in the girls playing football in South Sudan. Le manque de, de connaissance, le manque d'information, le manque d'éducation, constitue un frein effectivement au développement des jeunes filles et des femmes.
au Soudan du Sud. Mais nous pensons que en lançant ce, ce, cette phase pilote, en, tout, en ayant pris le temps, parce que la phase pilote, elle dure un an, de sensibiliser, de mettre à la disposition des kits de serviettes hygiéniques, euh, d'interagir de, avec les décideurs, les organisations de la société civile, il y aurait, on, on pourrait trouver tous en, ensemble des solutions idoines qui permettraient euh, aux jeunes filles et aux femmes au moins d'avoir moins de problèmes quand, quand il s'agit de, de la prise en charge de leur santé menstruelle et euh, de pouvoir vaquer à leur occupation quand elles le souhaitent. This team here is trying to pave way for the young ones, for the future generations, show them that girls can also play football because uh, for, for a long time football has been considered a taboo for the girls. But now at least people are accepting that football is part of us and that we can also get involved in it. FIFA just uh, having this project to help uh, the, the, the young girls who are upcoming footballers. It's something that is really great to us because so many girls face so many challenges and it's a great initiative that they've taken to come and help us. Ariana Demirovic is joining us now, FIFA's Head of Women's Football Development. It's a pleasure to have you here, Ariana. It's Welcome on the here. Living Football Sofa for Thank the first you. time. We just saw you in the video visiting South Sudan. What can you tell us about that trip? Well, the, the South Sudan trip has been uh, really exciting. It's uh, my third trip to South Sudan in the last six months because we've started a project with South Sudan Football Association on women's football, but also the project addresses the topic of menstrual hygiene management and building capacities of girls and women on the topic, using football as a tool to, to be able to address that challenge in the country. Uh, the South Sudan women's national team were in attendance, which was also really lovely uh, to see. What role can they play in A, growing football in South Sudan and B, being role models for young girls in South Sudan? The, the South Sudan women's national team, um, absolutely amazing pleasure to have them with us in this project. They went, went through a, a train the trainers workshop because they themselves proactively expressed that they would like to be part of the project and be closer to the community. And they would like to be trained so that they can themselves go into the community and address the topic with the girls as well. And for them, it's also a platform to empower them because they're currently in a role where um, they see themselves as players, but they are starting to see themselves also as ambassadors to the little girls in the country as well. And as you mentioned before, alongside the tournament, sanitary products were provided to the girls. Why is this so important? Um, I think uh, sanitary products um, are a big barrier in South Sudan, um, mainly because um, we address the topic of, of menstrual uh, hygiene management. Um, and we do raising awareness or education uh, around the topic. But what we've discovered speaking to the girls and women in South Sudan is that the access to the sanitary pro uh, products is very limited mm -hmm. and it also carries a certain economic burden on the family. So to be able to provide something to the girls that they can reuse to up uh, to one year uh, that is something that is of theirs, that empowers them, it gives them a bit of uh, ownership and something to also take care of, while in the process they're care taking care of their own health, um, is extremely important step in this project. Well, in South Sudan is one of the youngest countries in the world and 73% of the population are under 40. That brings huge responsibility, but also a huge potential. What has FIFA already done to improve football there, especially in the women's game? Well, yes, as you mentioned, South Sudan Football Association it was one of the newest member associations of FIFA. So um, together with our colleagues from the member association division, we are working hand in hand with the Football Association of South Sudan on different projects. In the last couple of years, they've been um, the ones in the region that launched their women's football strategy. We're first, one of the first member associations. They launched it in 2019. Um, of course, like any other member association, they've had challenges with COVID, but in the season 2020-2021, they've launched their first ever national league, which allowed their teams to compete um, in the proper format and the girls to be seen across uh, the country as well, but also to have that experience of what it is playing football on that level. 
Um, we work all that with the help of FIFA. Absolutely, with the help of FIFA, but also help of CAF, we've managed to work with their national teams to also get them ranked for the first time. They are ranked on the women's side of the game as well. And then through the programs that we've launched on the FIFA side, which are the development programs we launched in 2020, they are benefiting through league development, through um, women's football campaign, and then attaching this menstrual hygiene project to those existing programs that, that FIFA offers. Um, finally, they also, uh, individuals from their associations, such as their head coach their, and their executive board member. They are part of our other programs, like the coach mentorship program that we've just recently launched. So their women's national team uh, coach is one of the mentees of the program. And then the women in football leadership program we've done in March this year, the executive board member of South Sudan Football Association um, was one of the participants. So. Um, the idea of FIFA is to strengthen their existing structures, build their capacity, not just through one project, but really giving them an opportunity to, to strengthen their entire ecosystem of women's football. And increase the professionalization in football, which is in line with the president's vision to make football truly global, definitely. Ariana, you are FIFA's head of women's football development. One of the leading women of FIFA would brought you into football. Um, well, football's always been a passion of mine uh, since I was uh, very little. Um, my father was a goalkeeper, so I would say we, would, uh, we, were, uh, uh, or we are a football family. Football is a, is a conversation that we have daily in the family, so it's something that I always saw the value of and, and uh, appreciated the experience of football. And then, of course, I um, come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, also had an upbringing post-war um, and maybe didn't have all the same opportunities that uh, girls and women have across the globe. So maybe I, I could not reach some of these things, but for me it was always something that fueled my passion to make sure that some other girls somewhere around the globe get that opportunity. And now you're helping girls all over the world, so congratulations. Thank you very much. And Ariana, what is the next step in terms of women's football development? Well, as you know, we have a very ambitious strategy for women's football um, and we also have uh, the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand uh, coming uh, very soon. We still have time, but we, there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on. Um, on the women's football development side, as I mentioned, we do have development programs that more than 80 member associations are currently benefiting from. And the idea is really to work hand in hand with, with those MAs, but also um, empower the other ones to apply as well and try to tap into um, projects such as South Sudan that are quite particular to the context that then benefit the member association, but also help us implement our strategy. Thank you very much, Ariana. It was Thank a pleasure too. to have you here. Please come and visit us more often on I the Living Football Thank Sofa. you very much. Thank you very much, Ariana. Well, a football is such an important tool when it comes to empowering girls and young women all over the continent. So we take a leap from East to West Africa, where champions emerged in Guinea. La Guinée a eu la grande chance de faire partie des trois pays retenus pour ce projet novateur, parce que ce projet permet à la jeune fille guinéenne de s'émanciper socialement et économiquement. On lui apprend à se prendre en main et à être leader dans tous les domaines d'activité qu'elle va se choisir demain. En plus, ce projet a permis de sensibiliser les communautés à accepter de laisser les filles non seulement aller à l'école, mais éviter les mutilations génitales, ensuite Euh, vraiment euh, les sensibiliser à permettre d'accepter leur émancipation sociale. L'objectif c'est de contribuer à l'amélioration du leadership, au renforcement du leadership des filles à travers ce projet. Parce que le constat est que les filles, disons, sont laissées pour compte dans certains processus. Les filles ne sont pas plus ou moins dans des communautés, dans certaines communautés considérées, elles n'ont pas de prise de décision. Elles ne décident pas pour elles, on décide à leur place. Pour nous donc, ce projet champion, c'est un créneau pour que ces filles-là se transforment, pour que ces filles-là participent au processus de leur développement personnel, à travers des renforcements de capacités, de la confiance en soi par exemple, des compétences de vie et tant d'autres. 
pour qu'elles puissent prendre une décision d'elles-mêmes par rapport à leur vie, mais aussi contribuer au processus de développement de leur communauté. Le projet m'a apporté la joie de participer dans l'équipe de football, de pouvoir m'exprimer en public. Cela m'a donné une idée de l'autonomisation à travers le ZEC. J'étais à l'école, au collège de Boulevers. Elles sont parties là-bas. Elles m'ont nommé. Elles ont inscrit que je vis que c'est bien. On a commencé ici de jouer. On a joué jusqu'à aujourd'hui. On a vu que c'est bien. C'est important de prôner l'égalité entre la femme et l'homme. Parce que tout le monde pense que le football c'est pour les hommes seulement. Cela va montrer aux femmes que. Elles peuvent jouer aussi le football. Le but de cette mission, donc, qui est conjointe avec l'AFD et Plan International, c'est vraiment euh, voir sur le terrain l'impact du projet. Et on a pu le voir euh, au niveau des différents euh, acteurs, que ce soit les autorités locales, que ce soit les familles, que ce soit les joueuses, qu'il y a une véritable adhésion et un engouement par rapport à ce projet. Donc la FIFA est très satisfaite et nous aimerions par la suite vraiment optimiser euh, le projet. Mais à l'heure actuelle, on a vraiment... Euh, on a vraiment un excellent impact sur le terrain. Alors c'est un projet pilote, on a mis un peu ensemble nos grandes forces, donc euh, la transmission de valeur par le sport pour la FIFA et puis pour l'AFD c'est vraiment d'avoir des projets qui ont un impact positif sur l'égalité de genre. Donc on a allié ces deux grandes dimensions avec un outil très fédérateur qui est le sport et qui est très populaire aussi dans les communautés. Le football, pas, pas n'importe quel sport, donc il y a beaucoup de... De, de personnes qui suivent les matchs de football, qui sont très intéressées dans, dans les communautés où on intervient. Donc, il y a vraiment cet engouement. Moi, ma mère et mon père avaient accepté depuis le début, avant que j'amène les cadeaux. Je l'avais parlé et elle a dit que c'est bon pour la santé et c'est bon aussi pour, pour la vie. Je suis très fier de la participation de ma fille au sein de cette équipe championne. Puisque depuis qu'elle y a adhéré, elle se développe, et là, il y a la fraternité, il y a le développement chichique et même social qui, qui a progressé entre elle et ses copines. Et pour moi, personnellement, ce projet champion, c'est un projet de rassemblement. Ça permet aux jeunes filles de briser les tabous qui existent entre hommes et femmes. Et je pense que de, durant ces trois ans, J'aurai une fille compétitive non seulement au niveau national mais au niveau international. Donc je suis fier et je souhaite que euh, le projet champion s'élargisse sur toute l'étendue du territoire guinéen. Il y a eu la chance énorme, à mon avis, de faire partie de ce projet novateur qui est le projet de champion. Et à travers ce projet, nous avons réussi à mobiliser dans 22 communes de, de la Guinée et 48 heures de jeu, vraiment euh, les communautés qui ont accepté, hein, parce qu'elles ont été sensibilisées, qui ont accepté de libérer leurs jeunes filles afin qu'on puisse les former, leur apprendre à travers le sport, le football, à affronter la vie et à, à, à être devant, à être, à être des leaders et à améliorer leur... Euh, leur croyance en elles, parce que c'est très important que les jeunes filles aient confiance en elles, qu'elles sachent qu'elles ont les mêmes aptitudes que les garçons. Il suffit tout simplement qu'on leur donne la possibilité de l'exprimer et avec ce projet, elles l'expriment très bien. In addition to Guinea, the project has also been implemented in Benin and Togo. This project is just one of many. And in our forthcoming episodes, we continue to showcase some of the myriad projects that FIFA and the FIFA Foundation are developing, supporting and funding all around the world. Well, that's it again for this episode of Living Football. Looking forward to the next one. Until then, all the best, stay healthy and bye-bye.